This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, demonstrations amid the pandemic. I think it's a lot easier for people to refrain from social interactions, but expecting people to stay silent when there is a justice that has been ongoing for so long, that's, that's a bigger ask and a much more difficult ask. Safety and social justice when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. I don't have that security anymore. I lose this business. I lose everything. The Balancing Act for Business Owners in This Economy. Then, don't expect to be an expert right away. It doesn't come easy, and that's part of the joy of it. Grab a glass of wine and get comfortable. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. The last few months in America have been earth-shaking by any standard. First, we had the pandemic of COVID-19. Who would have thought that a virus could bring the entire country nearly to a halt, tossing 40 million of us out of our jobs, keeping most of us at home? Then on Memorial Day, George Floyd died in Minneapolis, just one of about a thousand Americans killed each year by police. But for many people, the graphic video of the last nine minutes of Floyd's life was the last straw. Thousands of people took to the streets in protest of excessive force by police and racism in its application. And they marched despite the threat of coronavirus. However, if more cases of COVID result from the demonstrations, they're probably only starting to show up right now. Anytime you have a large gathering of people who are in close proximity, this enables a situation in which you could have a disease transmitted. And that is certainly the case with COVID-19. Dr. Julie Swan is department head and Allison Distinguished Professor in the Fitz Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at North Carolina State University. She's also been a science advisor on pandemic response to the CDC. I'm certainly watching the pandemic cases where I expect an increase in transmission from a number of different kinds of events that have been happening as states have reopened. Some churches or places of worship have had additional gatherings. And then finally, protests have been another area in which there has been gathering. A lot of what determines how many cases will occur is driven by specific behaviors. I'll give you an example. Today in my town, there was an agreement that people would gather along the street from one part of town to the Capitol. People were spaced out, and this gathering was to bring attention to racial justice and these kinds of issues. People were spaced out. They had their posters. They had their masks. My family participated in this as well. There was very little risk of transmission that I saw at that particular event. Other events have been more risky, with people close together, where masks are no longer the most important thing, nearly a textbook way to spread a virus. I am sure... Many of the demonstrators, regardless of their race and ethnicity, are concerned about the spread of the disease, but they are also very concerned about what has been going on for so long and not seeing a big change and uh, wanting wanting to have their voice heard. And at some point, I think people want to speak up in the face of injustice and want change. That's Dr. Pinar Keskinajak, professor of industrial and systems engineering and director of the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems at Georgia Tech University. Despite the potential health impact, I think having the courage to do so during the pandemic is admirable. I just hope that the health impact doesn't end up becoming very, very significant for those who are involved or for others who may have been in contact with them. But it's, again, hard to say, not demonstrate, just don't do it because it's a health hazard. I think it's a lot easier for people 
to refrain from social interactions such as meeting with friends or going to bars and restaurants or going to pool parties. Those are much easier to do, but expecting people to stay silent when there is a justice that has been ongoing for so long, that's, that's a bigger ask and a much more difficult ask. Racism is also a public health problem, and there are people dying every day from acts of violence, from greater inequities in the system, and even dying from COVID-19 in communities of color. They're dying at greater rates, and there can be a number of different contributing causes to that. But, you know, it is certainly possible that if there's transmission occurring in a protest setting, that that could make this burden on the communities of color even worse. Of course, I hope that it doesn't. I hope instead that it brings attention to the problems, not only of racism, but also greater discussion about the additional burden on these communities. Last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics called racism a core cause of health problems in children and adolescents. But it increases the risk among adults, too, for virtually every health problem, including COVID-19. African Americans are more likely to live in tight quarters where distancing is harder. They're more frequently frontline employees who can't work at home and often don't have paid sick leave. COVID-19 infects black Americans at a much higher rate than whites and is lethal nearly two and a half times more often. And while protests have a long-term goal, in the short run, they can increase the risk, especially if they've resulted in a clash with police. The use of tear gas certainly increases the chances that people would be coughing and having difficulty breathing and could definitely increase the chances of particles coming out and spreading, especially if people were not wearing masks. So I am not a physicist, so I cannot speak to the physics of how these particles fly, but I think it's already well known that if you are coughing or sneezing, the speed of the particles coming out, as well as how far they can travel, is much more than compared to normal speech. So certainly the use of tear gas may have increased the chances that we would see this happen. Clearly, experts are worried that the pandemic recovery will take a big hit from demonstrations. However, teasing out the effect may be hard to do. One complication is the fact that many states were loosening shelter-in-place restrictions right around the same time the demonstrations hit the streets. So Swan and Kaskinajak aren't surprised by the uptick in cases just reported in more than a dozen states. They say it would have happened even if no protests had taken place. Interactions between people, as we know, increases the spread of the disease. And we have a lot of models on this that show the disease spread increasing when interactions increase. And we also have seen this already in data. So many states imposed stay-at-home orders for some period of time. We have seen the spread slow down during that time. And those restrictions, for the most part, have been lifted by now, and we see economy opening up in many regions in the U.S., and people are going back to work and, in some areas, going back to social interactions. So even if we did not have protests, our projections basically tell us that we would see an increase in the infections in the coming weeks just because of the increased level of interactions and the economy opening up in many areas. The COVID-19 disease will continue to spread beyond the places where it hit initially. Now we are seeing that there are starting to be cases in various rural communities driven by a particular type of environment in that location, prison settings, the meat industry. You could also have it driven by nursing homes. And so based on when the virus just happened to find its way to that particular rural community, you can have that rural community blow up, if you will, at different points in time. Experts like Kaskinajak and Swan are poring over infection statistics for early warning signs. But in some places, they may not see them the way they should. You can't really look just at the most recent time points, but really have to look a little bit further back. I look at hospitalizations, I look at deaths, 
And I look at all of that. Now, we know that there is a time lag between hospitalizations and deaths and when that initial infection occurred. And we even know that there's a time lag between when the virus was transmitted and when it starts to show up in the testing cases as well. In general, a good rule of thumb is that what you do today impacts the cases that we'll see two weeks from now. Looking at different states can be a little like comparing apples and oranges. Swan says the data is not consistent. So to really get a handle on this pandemic or anyone in the future, she says we need a better disease surveillance system in the U.S. I would like to see more detailed geographies including down to the county level. I'd like to see a breakdown by racial ethnic groups, which would really show us that burden of disease, including with perhaps within different states or other specific locations. I'd like to see a breakdown of how many cases are occurring in congregate living settings like nursing homes and prisons versus how many are occurring in perhaps workplaces like manufacturing plants or other locations. I would like to see a lot more than what we're seeing. I think that that's going to need several things. One is that our national system of surveillance needs an overhaul. It's really time to take advantage of the many different kinds of information that we have in the health system and utilize those to the maximum extent possible. Swan says we also need more testing data separating antibody testing from active infections. But however those numbers are processed, Keskinajak says the bump we've already shown proves one thing. Our lives really are in our own hands. That's one thing that I would like to emphasize over and over again that we do not have medical interventions for this disease. We do not have a vaccine. We do not have a broadly available effective antiviral. So what we have is really non-medical interventions or behaviors. This is really in our hands as the public. How this disease spreads, how far, how wide, is completely in our hands. It depends on our choices, on our actions, on our behaviors, now and in the coming weeks. However, for most of us, simply living during the pandemic has meant taking on some risk. Swan says each of us has to weigh what we're comfortable with against our needs, and those needs will vary from person to person. For some, not protesting is not an option. Speaking out is part of the new normal. That new normal should balance my own particular risks and whatever those might be, along with the risks in my community at a particular point in time, and balance the needs that I might have. And those needs can be quite wide, from obtaining food to haircuts, which many people across the United States are in dire need of, or haircuts for the dog. But it could also be a protest and a need to express speech and personal opinions about racial injustice and death and other kinds of things. And I certainly think that there are ways to balance risk and still participate and have a way of expressing one's views. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. More than 3 million Americans can tell you that chronic migraine is a serious disease, and its symptoms can often be debilitating. Imagine living half the month or more with headaches and migraines lasting four hours a day or longer. Leading neurologist Dr. Jennifer McVig is partnering with Allergan, an AbbVie company, during Migraine and Headache Awareness Month this June to encourage those living with chronic migraine to see a health care provider for diagnosis and treatment. This month, we are raising awareness of chronic migraine and the importance of seeking treatment options such as Botox, onobotulinum toxin A. Botox is a prescription medicine for adults with chronic migraine 15 or more headache days a month, each lasting four hours or more. It is not approved for adults with migraine who have 14 or fewer headache days a month. Botox is the first FDA-approved preventive treatment for chronic migraine, which can help prevent a headache or migraine before it starts. 
Many of my chronic migraine patients have been treated with Botox, clinically proven to prevent an average of eight to nine headache days and migraine or probable migraine days a month versus six to seven for placebo. Effects of Botox may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness can be signs of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Side effects may include allergic reactions, neck and injection site pain, fatigue, and headache. Don't receive Botox if there's a skin infection. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor your medical history, muscle or nerve conditions, including ALS Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and medications including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. Talk to your doctor. Visit BotoxChronicMigraine.com or call 1-866-310-4649 to learn more. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and RadioHealthJournal.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. They always seem to say the same thing, which is, wow, I thought it was crazy before I got here. I had no idea that there were this many people suffering this long from a quote-unquote mild case of COVID. People whose coronavirus infection drags on and on. Then can you deprive yourself of oxygen by wearing a face mask? What you're doing is you're exhaling into the mask and keeping your breath from going a long distance. And you're not so worried about the inhaling part. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.